In early December 1941, two British capital ships arrived at Singapore, the nucleus of a long-promised Eastern Fleet. Within days, they found themselves at the front line of a full-scale Japanese attack, as the war in the Pacific began. The threat from Japan in the East had long been recognised by the British, ever since the expiry of the Anglo-Japanese Alliance in 1922 and the signature of the Washington Treaty that limited the size of the Royal Navy. In 1923, the first Lord of the Admiralty, Leo Amory, told the Prime Minister of South Africa, if there were ever a European combination against us at the same moment as war was declared against us by Japan, we should be in a position of extraordinary difficulty. To counter this, a new large naval base at Singapore was constructed, where a British battle fleet could be positioned in the event of war in Europe. It was hoped that the presence of a British fleet there would deter any Japanese aggression. But after a war in Europe did begin in 1939, the decision was taken to prioritise ships to the Mediterranean, so no battle fleet was deployed east. With no deterrent in the Far East, the British were forced into concessions to Japan to avoid war in 1940. They looked to the United States for support, hoping that its own fleet could act as a deterrent, but the US was not interested in protecting the British position in the Far East, what it fundamentally saw as British imperialism. In July 1941, Japan fully occupied Vichy French-controlled Indochina. This set alarm bells ringing in London. Suddenly, Japan had naval and air bases in southern Vietnam, putting Singapore and the Dutch East Indies at risk of short-range attack. The need for a fleet at Singapore intensified. The first sea lord, Admiral Sir Dudley Pound, did not want to spare any of the Royal Navy's most modern battleships from the Atlantic, not while the German battleship Tirpitz remained at large. He therefore proposed in August 1941 that a fleet of slower, older battleships be sent east. The Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, had other ideas. He favoured a small number of the Navy's best ships being dispatched to Singapore to act like a British Bismarck, offering an elusive menace to Japanese offensive plans and tying down a disproportionate number of Japanese capital ships. There were a number of problems with this approach. The new King George V-class battleships were slower than Bismarck, had only recently come into service and would be facing much more sophisticated Japanese naval aviation than the British had deployed against Bismarck. The Admiralty made its opposition clear, arguing that it was just too soon for the brand new Prince of Wales to be deployed, but to no avail. When the Foreign Secretary, Anthony Eden, intervened to argue that Prince of Wales could act as a deterrent to Japan even declaring war in the first place, the decision was made. On October 25th, the Royal Navy's second newest battleship sailed for Singapore, carrying Admiral Sir Tom Phillips, newly appointed as the Commander-in-Chief of the grandly named Eastern Fleet. As the British had been agonising over Singapore, the Japanese had been preparing for war. They had been committed to expanding southwards since July 1941. In truth, the presence or absence of a couple of British battleships at Singapore was not going to change this, whether it be Prince of Wales or the older group of ships the Admiralty ended up arguing for. By November 7th, Japan had settled on December 8th, with attacks on Hong Kong, the East Indies, Malaya and Burma, as well as the preemptive attack on Pearl Harbour. At the end of November, Prince of Wales rendezvoused with the battlecruiser Repulse at Ceylon. Along with a very small destroyer screen, they were to be Britain's main naval strength in the east until reinforcements could arrive in 1942. Admiral Phillips arrived in Singapore on December 2nd. Less than 24 hours later, he was signalled by the Admiralty that Japanese submarines were heading south to watch Singapore. It was becoming clear that the dispatch of two capital ships had done nothing to deter Japan as hoped. Not long afterwards, on December 6th, RAF air reconnaissance spotted Japanese convoys off Indochina heading south. There was immediate alarm that these were heading for Siam and Malaya. Repulse was quickly recalled from a planned cruise to Port Darwin to be ready to act. Overnight on December 8th, Singapore was attacked in a long-range bombing raid, and a few hours later Admiral Phillips was informed that Pearl Harbor had been bombed 
that hostile troops were streaming ashore in northern Malaya and that Britain was at war with the Empire of Japan. Japan's attack meant that Admiral Phillips's fleet had failed before a shot had even been fired, and the mauling of the US fleet at Pearl Harbor meant that the Allies were for now decisively outnumbered at sea. Phillips also knew that estimates of the Japanese force off Malaya had their destroyer strength outnumbering his by 5 to 1. But regardless, the Japanese transports on loading troops had to be stopped. For Malaya to be saved, the invasion had to be halted in the north. So despite the odds, the Eastern Fleet, designated operationally as Force Z, left Singapore at 6.30 on December 8th and swung north. The big unknown for the British Admiral was Japanese air power. In the Mediterranean, no attacks from shore-based aircraft had been made more than 200 miles away from their base. It was at least 300 miles from the target area to Indochina. With the large distance and element of surprise, Phillips hoped that any aircraft over Malaya would not be expecting ships and would be equipped with high explosive bombs for attacking land targets. So, when at 1am on December 9th news came that no RAF fighter support from airfields in northern Malaya would be available, Prince of Wales pressed on. The morning brought cloud and mist, which helpfully shielded the British ships from the air. But by 1.40pm, a lurking Japanese submarine spotted Force Z and quickly signalled its position and course to the Imperial Navy. The Japanese ordered a task force to intercept, and aircraft in Indochina that had already loaded for ground attack had their armament swapped out for torpedoes and armour-piercing bombs. By evening, the clouds had lifted. At 5.40, Prince of Wales spotted Japanese reconnaissance planes tracking the fleet. With the element of surprise now clearly and obviously lost, the prospect of a successful attack was slim. Admiral Phillips had no choice but to turn back to Singapore. It was 500 miles back to base for Force Z, and at 2.10am they were again spotted by a submarine. This gave the Japanese an up-to-date position and course, and meant that attack aircraft began taking off while it was still dark. That same night, Phillips received reports of additional Japanese landings at Kuantan, and decided to take a detour to investigate with the prospect of a surprise attack enticing the British Admiral once again. After hours of steaming west, when the sun came up, Force Z was disappointed to find Kuantan in complete peace, according to the destroyer HMS Electra. There were no additional landings. And to make matters worse, the British ships had been spotted again by Japanese aircraft. Phillips turned south, but curiously did not signal to ask for fighter cover from Singapore. A few minutes after 11, eight Japanese bombers appeared over the horizon. Force Z's anti-air batteries launched into a barrage, with 66 guns of 4-inch caliber and higher opening up on their attackers. It was to little effect. None of the first wave was shot down and Repulse was straddled by bombs, suffering one hit to her port hangar. 20 minutes later, a second wave of nine torpedo planes followed, using patches of cloud cover to mask their approach. They darted in for attack runs in pairs or groups of three. It was very well drilled, and the British AA failed to disrupt them. The consequences were severe. At 11.42, Prince of Wales was hit aft by two torpedoes in quick succession. It was an ultimately mortal injury. Her steering gear and engine rooms were smashed, putting the ship into a slow, continual turn to port, listing badly. At 12.10, the flagship signalled that she was not under control. It had taken just a single torpedo ray to cripple one of the Royal Navy's most modern battleships. Meanwhile, shortly before midday, Captain Tennant of Repulse signalled Singapore to request air cover, before manoeuvring sharply to dodge the tracks of six oncoming torpedoes. There was an almost constant wave of Japanese aircraft now. Another wave came in, and eight more torpedoes were successfully sidestepped by the battlecruiser. While Repulse was practicing its torpedo beats, Prince of Wales was taking a huge amount of punishment now. By 1226, the flagship had been hit by four more torpedoes, and its speed was down to eight knots. One aircraft now finally scored a hit on Repulse, sneaking through after a dummy run towards Prince of Wales. The Japanese bombers now focused on the battlecruiser, attacking from all directions so Captain Tennant couldn't dodge them all. 
The AA batteries raged and the occasional hostile aircraft was shot down, but it was not nearly enough. Repulse was hit by four torpedoes in as many seconds and quickly took on a huge list to port. Tennant realised quickly that the ship was doomed and ordered abandoned ship. At 12.33, Repulse, a 25-year-old veteran of the First World War, rolled over and sank. A short distance away, Prince of Wales was still struggling on, slowly losing its battle with the sea. At 12.50, the ship signalled for Singapore to send all available tugs, but it was far too late. At 1.20, she too capsized and sunk, only 325 days after being commissioned. Just as she slipped below the waves, 11 RAF fighters arrived over the area. They had taken off just seven minutes after Repulse's signal had been received. It remains somewhat of a mystery why air cover hadn't been asked for earlier in the morning. It was a grim defeat for the Royal Navy. Months of prevaricating over the right combination of ships to send had ended up with two capital ships being sacrificed for precisely zero benefit. The only comfort was that destroyers were on hand to pick up many of the crew. From the two ships, 2,081 sailors had been rescued, with 837 killed. The sinking of Prince of Wales and Repulse gave the Japanese full naval control in the Far East, and allowed easy support for their invasion of Malaya, which was in full swing, and which we'll be looking at in the next episode. <laughs>